This week, a Green Magazine special featuring the dirtiest bankers. While Wall Street says it's heading for net zero, who is still making money from fossil fuels? These big banks make a good amount of money lending to oil companies, gas companies, pipelines, and Wells Fargo, they have been right at the top. What keeps you up at night? Sculptor Maya Lin tells us about her climate nightmares. It was a natural focus of mine to emphasize how critically precarious our planet is becoming due to us. And tracking Tesco's recycling. We find out what your supermarket really does with all that soft plastic. Most people have no idea what happens to, to uh, their waste once they put it in a, in a, in a bin or a trash can. Um, and that's especially true of plastic. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. This week, we're focusing on the latest print edition of Bloomberg Green, the next solar system. The world has already hit 1 trillion watts of solar energy output, but it's highly concentrated in developed nations who have relied on subsidies and cheap production in China to shift to renewable power. How can we make sure the next trillion watts gets to those who need it most? In this edition of Bloomberg Green, we'll delve into this story by looking at the architectural movement that's making houses with net negative emissions around the world. Our reporter Jess Schenkelman draws the connection between investment and inequality in England's capital city. Sculptor and artist Maya Lin tells us her deepest fears when it comes to the climate crisis, and we investigate why one of Wall Street's least green banks is still lending money to oil and gas companies. First, we'll focus in on the United Kingdom. In recent months, supermarkets across the UK have put soft plastic deposit points outside their stores. Tesco, the nation's biggest supermarket brand, even ran an ad campaign saying recycling soft plastics shouldn't be hard. But Bloomberg received a tip that instead of recycling this material, Tesco was in fact shipping it to Eastern Europe, where it was being burned in cement kilns. Our reporter Kit Shellow put electronic trackers on some of his waste to find out where all his plastic really ends up. Most people have no idea what happens to, to uh, their waste once they put it in a, in a, in a bin or a trash can. Um, and that's especially true of plastic. It just goes away, you know, it's collected by a van or it's deposited at a recycling point and then it goes into this hidden ecosystem that very few people have oversight of. Tesco makes a big play of reuse as one of its efforts to, to, to help prevent plastic pollution. I had, I had three digital trackers placed in, in, in wrappers or bags and put into the Tesco boxes which said they were going to recycle them. And then I had to wait a few days to see where they went. Um, and uh, yeah, they started to move uh, within three or four days of, of me dropping them off and I could see them moving by truck. Um, one of them went to East London and then sort of disappeared into what looked like the banks of the Thames. Uh, it may have been lost, it may have been shaken loose, I really don't know what happened to it. But the two other ones took a pretty clear path, which was to go to these, these Tesco logistics centres, uh, you know, on the outskirts of London and then they both headed for the same port, which is Harwich International. And from there, um, they went quiet for a few hours, and the next time I saw them was when they were in the Netherlands and heading east. There are some kinds of plastic that are relatively easy to recycle, and those can be sold on the open market profitably. Things like clear plastic bottles uh, are made from something called PET, and that's good recycling material. You can reuse that over and over again clear plastic wrap as long as it doesn't have a label or colorants or you know heat retardants in it is good recycling material you can you can melt that down and reprocess it but as anyone who, who goes to the supermarket to buy food will know hardly any of the plastic products that we're sold are just clear wrap they have labels on they will normally be coming into contact with food and all that means that um, it's not all the same stuff it's different grades of plastic and you can't just put all that material together into one bulk load and then melt it and recycle it. What you'd get up if you did that is unusable, terrible quality plastic. So what you need to do is separate it. They didn't stay long in the Netherlands. They passed through very quickly and then they, uh, you know, 
went on a German motorway and zipped across the country in, in the space of sort of 12 to 24 hours. And uh, finally they crossed the border into Poland and I could see that both digital trackers, although this happened on different days, ended up at precisely the same spot. What we found in Jelonogora was uh, a long industrial building, a warehouse. It must have been as long as a football field or longer. There were, you know, there were hundreds of tons of material just sitting out there waiting to be sent somewhere else. There are two main reasons why a, a lot of plastic waste is exported. The first is that disposing of plastic in a developed economy like the UK or Germany or the US is expensive. But there are also um, lots of government incentives that are designed to make recycling a more attractive proposition. You get credit from the government for exporting material for recycling. We know that some kinds of plastic are easy to use. You know, the problem that the world has to grapple with is what happens to the bad plastic, what happens to the stuff that simply isn't economic to, to use again. So one of my digital trackers was inside a, a lentil puff wrapper, like a snack wrapper. Uh, I was very keen to see where that one went. And uh, I saw it on the move again about 24 hours after it had been sorted at Zielonogora, and it headed east across Poland to a tiny town called Poniatowa. Um, and I found out there that it had been sent to a company called Stellapak. And they have a facility there that can turn soft plastic back into soft plastic. Um, but they also have a way to dispose of the plastic they can't use. They have an on-site incinerator, which provides heat and energy for their factory. The tracker uh, inside the Tesco plastic bag stopped pinging when it arrived in Jelonogora after a few days, and I assumed it had been shredded or destroyed or trampled on or taken. And then when I got back from Poland, um, I was surprised to see it, its location had changed, uh, and it gave its location as southern Turkey. Unfortunately, Turkey, as a destination for waste, has huge problems, and a lot of the plastic that goes to Turkey ends up being illegally disposed of. The tracker ended up at this industrial estate, uh, a sort of a quite remote one. Um, there was no sort of there was no plastic recycling company nearby that we could identify, so we were confused as to why it was there. And uh, you know, we we sent a journalist to the ground um, to drive out and, and visit this site. What she found outside a warehouse, just just left in a big pile was tons and tons of waste from plastic waste from around Europe. Um, the facility itself wasn't a recycling facility. It was obviously just left there before it could be moved somewhere else. Tesco is a very large supermarket chain. It's the UK's largest by far. It makes an enormous amount of profit every year. And um, it also has this incredible logistics infrastructure in place. And if this entity can't properly dispose of plastic, you know, what hope is there for a little cash-strapped town council that we want to dispose of our plastic by the curbside? Kit Chalel there with insight into what supermarkets are really doing with our recycling. Now let's focus in on the English capital, London. Last summer, Europe's financial hub was brought to a near standstill by torrential rain. Now, with a changing climate and a growing population, London faces a dual crisis. Let's bring in our reporter Jess Schenkelman now, who has been digging into this issue. So, Jess, how are climate change and housing interlinked in London? As you mentioned, last year there were um, huge floods across um, most of London's boroughs right in the middle of summer when nobody was expecting it. Now, that, this kind of flooding is called surface water flooding. So we tend to think of flooding as caused by, you know, there's a lot of rain that comes along, the rivers overflow, anyone near the river, they get hit by flooding. Surface water flooding is really different. In the last 20 years, people have started to realise that it's a serious threat to the city. So what happens is that because um, cities become more and more concreted over when it rains the water just runs really really fast into drains and those drains overflow because london's drainage system was built when queen victoria still sat on the throne for a city of four million people now there's over nine million people so it just can't cope the water comes back up and and causes flooding 
So that's a major problem. What we looked at is how that interacts with the housing crisis. So London also, as you know, it's, it's one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. Rents have risen by something like 25% in some boroughs in the, last, in the last year alone. They're starting to flatline. So people are really struggling to find places to rent or even buy. So the capital's under huge pressure to build more and more homes. The mayor of London has a target for 66,000 new homes to be built every year. So what they're doing inevitably is trying to find new places to build, and those places tend to be on floodplains. So we looked at one area um, in East London called Hackney Wick. It's a bit like the meatpacking district in New York. It was formerly an industrial area, and it's kind of been turned now into a very hip area with lots of cool new buildings and bars and homes. And that was flooded last year in July as well. We're finding that um, developers are being encouraged to build on these floodplains. It can be done really well, but there are instances where it's being done very poorly as well. All right, a complex problem for the modern world. Thank you so much to our green reporter, Jess Shankelman. Now coming up, Wall Street has made plenty of commitments to net zero in the last couple of years, but some bankers are still making lots of money from oil and gas. They say it's necessary, others say it's irresponsible. So which is nearer to the truth? And the global population is expected to grow to almost 10 billion by 2050. So as well as needing more energy, we'll need places for those people to live. What if there's a form of architecture that creates jobs, but also slashes emissions? We'll look next at the pioneers of the Passive House. This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Commercial and residential buildings account for 13% of all U.S. emissions. But what if there's a way to cut that number back drastically? When Maine builder Jesper Cruz began marketing a type of high-efficiency home called a passive house a dozen years ago, the dwellings appealed mainly to a small cohort of committed environmentalists. Today, demand for passive houses is rising sharply as homeowners contend with climate-driven extreme weather and governments move to decarbonize buildings. Here's how Cruz could provide a model for both the homes and the jobs of the future. The main motivation for me to switch over to building passive houses is that it's just a better product. It has all kinds of great benefits for the environment, but all the things that makes these homes really energy efficient also happens to make them really comfortable. They're healthier to be in, they're more resilient. When I heard about the Passive House Standard and the promise of saving 80 to 90% on heating and cooling cost and 70% of overall energy usage, I just thought, well, this is where we need to go. This is where the industry needs to go. No question, it doesn't make any sense to build the way we do now. We're currently 12 people. We built two to three residential homes a year, some light commercial. We've seen probably close to like a tenfold in interest in the last couple of years. A passive house is a home that is built to the passive house standard, which is a German developed energy standard, which is all related to how much energy the house is using and to the air tightness of the home. So every single home we built is kind of rooted in that building science and they all have the principles of a passive house in them. They don't all reach the passive house standard, but you can still build a home that's really efficient and has all these benefits. So this project is, you know, it's going to have the the principles of a passive house, if you're looking up in the roof construction here. So you can see like what we're talking about, super insulation and you know thermal bridging, avoiding thermal bridges. You can see how we have these TJIs. So we're not having like traditional wooden rafter that goes all the way through the building. We just have this thin little web. And in this project, we're using cellulose insulation. So it's basically recycled newspaper that we insulate with. So it's one of those products that has like a low carbon footprint. It's better for the environment. Air tightness is really important. If when you're looking on the outside, you can see that before we even started building anything, we had already put down strips of membrane. When you're building a passive house compared to a traditional home, the way that it changes the process is front-loading the design process. You really want to iron out the vast majority of details. If we are talking about environmental benefits, 
you definitely want to look at the overall energy consumption of the house, but even more important is looking at the materials that you're using within the house because some products are really energy intensive to produce, whereas other products have a very low carbon footprint. All right. In the beginning when we started building, it was tough to get certain materials. There were limited window manufacturers that make like triple pane windows. Now, most of the materials and the technology is really available. If you're building a single family home, I would say it's probably about 10% more to build it compared to a traditionally built home. If you're building like big commercial buildings or multi-unit apartment buildings, I think it's probably a break even. It does cost much more to build this way. I think the reason we're not seeing an explosive growth in North America, I think telling people that we want to do stuff differently and, and changing the way you operate your business, the industry is really slow to move. So <laughs> that was probably among the first 50 passive homes built in the United States. Let's switch things up now and dig into one of our big financial stories in this edition of Bloomberg Green Magazine. Despite the banking industry's pledges to go green over the last few years, that hasn't stopped lenders from cashing in on oil and gas. Max Abelson and Hannah Levitt have written about how Wells Fargo, one of the last Wall Street banks to name a net zero target, is playing the long game when it comes to the green transition. So, Max, just talk to me about the stance Wells Fargo is taking here. Absolutely. Well, one thing that's helpful about talking about Wells Fargo's stance is it's essentially Wall Street's stance. Hmm. Talking about Wells Fargo is really a way of talking about the whole American finance industry and the, glo the global finance industry right now. Because something has changed on Wall Street over the last, really it's over the last year, but you could say the year, the last year or two if you wanted, which is that you know historically on Wall Street, bankers and lenders, the people who provide capital to the fossil fuel industry, you know, if you go back a couple of years, certainly if you go back five or 10 years, ESG was essentially a random three letters. You know, you would not hear it very often. And the way um, that a guy named Dan Pickering, a real veteran of the, of the energy industry, described it to us is like, you know, if, if people were lending to the oil and gas industry, their attitude was like, yeah, yeah, I'm lending to the oil and gas industry. That's our job. In the last year or two, what my colleague Hannah Levitt and I found is that the big banks, essentially all in unison, although it was, it was over different, diff, different time periods, all basically said, we get it. Mm. We don't want to contribute to the problem over the grand scheme of things. We want to, um, we want to go net zero, which means uh, essentially zeroing out emissions by the middle of the century. And that creates tension, which is what our story is about, because these big banks make a good amount of money lending to oil companies, gas companies, pipelines, and Wells Fargo over, over the last year and over the last five years since the Paris agreements, mm. they have been right at the top. Well, let's talk about that lending. At what scale to the oil and gas industry are we realistically talking about? We're talking a lot of money. So I don't know what you would think is a lot of money, but in the last year, so 2021, Wells Fargo alone was the book runner on about $28 billion worth of global fossil fuel loans. So, and not, not to bore our audience here, but just to be very specific, those are syndicated loans. Okay. Those are syndicated loans and we're looking at book runners. But, you know, just to be fair to Wells Fargo and, and to, give, to give viewers a, a sense of context, you know, companies, not just oil and gas companies, but co corporations throughout America, you know, they, they make their money, um, you know, they can raise equity, obviously, they can uh, borrow these loans, but they also issue bonds. If you want to look at bonds, I think JP Morgan will be ahead. If you want to look at loans, Wells Fargo will be ahead, but JP Morgan's not, not far behind. And, you know, it's, it's a matter of, um, when we spoke to Wells Fargo and we asked them how, how, they, view, how they view this, Scott Warrender, who's essentially the, the head of their energy, they were saying like, look, you know, the energy transition is not, it's not flipping a light switch. It's not going from fossil fuels one day to green the next. They want to be part of the green transition, they say. You know, but um, in the meantime, there is gonna be pressure on them from the government, from nonprofits, from environmentalists to you know, get with the program sooner rather than later. Well, that's something we talk a lot about on the show. It's called a transition for a reason. It requires transitioning. All right, really interesting to get a lens into this. Thank you so much to Bloomberg News reporter, Max Abelson. Now coming up as part of a new series for Bloomberg Green Magazine, sculptor and artist Maya Lin talks to us about how climate inspires her work and crucially, what keeps her up at night? This is Bloomberg Green.
From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Maya Lin is an architect, designer, and sculptor, best known for her design of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. But as well as marking U.S. history, much of her work takes inspiration from environmental themes. Her 2021 installation, Ghost Forest, won her the Wall Street Journal Magazine's Innovators Award for its haunting depiction of the impacts of climate change. As part of a new series for Bloomberg Green, we asked her, what keeps you up at night? Sometimes art has the power and capacity to get us to feel something almost instantaneously. We can think of climate change as an abstract threat Art can present it in a new way that's going to get you to stop and rethink the problem a little bit. My interest and concern in caring for the environment has been there all along. And even you go back to the very first memorial, I just wanted to preserve the park. As I got more concerned about climate change, it was a natural focus of mine to emphasize how critically precarious our planet is becoming due to us. The four memorials that I worked on before that, Vietnam, Civil Rights Memorial, the Women's Table at Yale, the Confluence Project, so I thought the fifth and the final would be one I call into being. This is my entire what is missing library. Missing is unlike anything else I've ever done on the memorials. Ostensibly, it started out I was going to focus on the extinction of species, the fact that we're in the sixth extinction. But then I realized that a main cause of climate change emissions is land use changes. And it's also the main driver for biodiversity loss. If I can get you to think about protecting species in lockstep motion with reducing emissions, so that we do not forget about biodiversity. I started interviewing scientists and they were, we cannot just talk about what we're losing without giving you what can be done to help. So missing, it is both a wake up call, this is what we're losing, but it is also, oh, this is what you could do individually, this is what we need to be thinking of globally. And it starts with a very simple premise, what if a monument, what if a memorial could jump form? What if it could exist in multiple sites and multiple media around the world, like Ghost Forest in Manhattan? These die-outs are happening all around the world because of climate change, and all of a sudden you go from a vibrant living forest to a rust-red dead forest. And on the East Coast, the Pine Barrens, the Atlantic Cedar, they're being killed off by rising seas. So. We chose trees that were actually being taken out because the salt water had come in to bring a ghost forest to downtown Manhattan. This is one of the first maquettes I ever made for ghost forest. We calculated our entire carbon footprint to go get the trees, bring them back. It took three years, but as well, it has to arrest you. It has to stop you. You have to feel something walking through a dead forest. There's just a sense of, of ghosts. Maya Lin there opening up about her biggest climate concerns. So from climate negative houses to smarter city planning and holding companies to account for their net zero goals, that's just some of the ways we can ensure the next trillion watts of energy is spent in the right place. That wraps it up for this week's special magazine edition of Bloomberg Green. You can keep the conversation going by following us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Climate. From Bloomberg's global headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green.